Um, I'm going to do this probably. So I'm going to introduce you like a professional would. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Wandering Bear Sports Podcast, the number one sports podcast in the world. Uh, I'm just going to keep saying that till it comes true. Uh, special guest today, Tatafu Pilotu now. How are you, mate? Hello, Duncan. How are you? Good, mate. Good to see you. Now, Thank where you. where are you in the world at the moment? Uh, so I've res- resided back with my parents, which is in Guildford. Oh, nice. Um, so, yeah, after uh, being... Uh, being made redundant from COVID over in the UK. I came back in uh, July of 2020. Yep. I'm sure everyone can forget that year. But uh, in saying that, uh, just thought I'd give myself a six-month sabbatical, just get back to uh, real life before making any other major uh, decisions. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, it's been great to be back in God's country. Um, now, I've got a lot I want to talk to you about but before i get into it i was just doing some reading on you and you there's there's no articles of you actually saying you've hung the boots up so have you officially hung the boots up well you hit, you heard it first on wandering bear sports we've got some breaking news yes uh <laughs> i have hung up the boots um officially as of uh july 2020 but at the same time uh it was never announced only because uh yeah, there was some things going on in my mind, but uh, yeah. after uh, a horrid uh, 2020 20 years, it gave me some time to think about things, and I think it's time for me to uh, hang up the boots officially nice, and uh, get on with uh, the rest of my life. Starting now, a new chapter. I, I'm going to talk to you about your career, but um, from purely selfish point of view, how are you feeling about retirement? Because I've just retired as well, and there's sort of oh, congratulations. I, Thanks, mate. Thanks. I, n- I never played at the level you played at, but it's still an interesting sort of mix of emotions. And why did you come to de- the decision and how are you feeling about it? Uh, good question. Uh, I think entirely it just came down to the fact that after putting on the boots back again for club rugby, don't get me wrong, I still enjoyed getting out there with uh, all my old former teammates back in the day. But I feel like uh, it was the right time for me to just because uh, I think I, I went through the same uh, roller coaster you did with all mixed emotions of whether you should give it up or not. But I was confident in myself saying um, that I've done the best that I could have um, playing rugby. So I think it's uh, time for me to step into a new venture and um, go discover some new things. But yeah, it's um, it's like for me, it's been an interesting sort of way of looking at it because i've it's obviously never really been a job for me fits and starts but it's it's a big part of your life and Mm -hmm. i i really looked at it and the thing that i i'm done i've was absolutely done maybe probably two years ago but i just hung around because i loved my southern districts really and i think the thing that i struggle with the most is a lack of purpose so even at a shoot shield level, you still have something to train for every week. You still got something to to work towards. Mm-hmm. And what what do you think about that? Is is that the thing for you, or is it is it not seeing your mates every day? Is it an identity thing? What what do you think is hard about it? And like, because I look at you, I I, know, I don't know you enormously well, but I, I've sort of observed you from afar, and I always looked at your rugby career as like it was what you did. It wasn't who you are. Is that would, that would that be fair to say, or or well, do, do you feel a bit differently about it? I, if anything, I was just uh, one of the guys that would like just do his job to the best of his ability and uh, like let the rest of the team take the accolades, really. Because at the end of the day, like it's a team sport. It's why I loved uh, and well, loved and enjoyed doing it because it's not just you on the field. Like you're there with forty other. Um, good mates that you actually build a build time making a bond um, with that. Uh, I think it's also um, like if I could juxtapose club, club rugby with professional side, the, the fundamentals of uh, bonding are right there in club rugby and wouldn't mind seeing a bit more of it back in uh, the elite side because. Do, do you mean like a few beers after the game? type thing or your midweek sort of thing or i think i think it depends on the culture they build as well um 
some cultures are really you've got to just focus on your job. Some are more about uh, get to know your teammate because at the end of the day, like he's the one that's going to be there for you in the end. Uh, yeah, so it sort of varies, but I guess overall, um, the, the one thing I loved about club rugby last year was um, we all come from different uh, backgrounds and upbringings, but the fact that you can actually go out there, have some fun for 80 minutes, well, I mean, fourth grade we played 60, but <laughs> regardless, it was just the fact that um, it made me fall in love with the sport again. You sort of lose that when you get to the higher um, echelons of uh, professional rugby. So, yeah, I hope uh, they don't lose that uh, importance, like, particularly uh, as the game keeps evolving. Um, so for, for those that don't know, you played fourth grade for do, – do you, do you see it as Western Sydney two blues or is it Parramatta two blues to you? Oh, I do see it as Western Sydney two blues, only for the mere fact that uh, before Penrith were um, included uh, last season, we sort of had to cover the whole catch on the West, Western Sydney as well. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, still Parramatta um, traditions, but in saying that we sort of wanted to grasp uh, – the whole um, catchment of Western Sydney. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, one thing I was to change. Sorry, we'll keep talking about this for a bit. Are you happy? With, are you happy with what you've done? Do you like? Do you, are you the kind of guy that reflects and go, "Look, I played ninety tests for my country, a shitload of Super Rugby games." Do you think about that, or is it just a good memory? And like, how, how yeah. do you how do you see it? Uh, to be honest, we've got to the point where like I used to procrastinate a lot particularly when I first started, uh, the, the, the more experience I got, I just uh, made sure that uh, what's done is done, put it aside, look forward to or be more so in the moment really because I think uh, you sort of miss the uh, variety of things in life. Like, I mean, uh, I went to the Botanical Gardens in the city last week and like, just smelling the fresh flowers was something I haven't done in ages. I mean... People sort a, of underestimate that, yeah. Because you had a weekend off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think, like, having weekends back rather than sort of building a bit of tension towards a game for the week, I mean, yeah, it's sort of refreshing in a way, to be honest. So, Did it? Time, oh, no, no, you go, you go. Oh, but at the same time, it was just more so um, trying to uh, emulate things that you learned from the past and put it, in whatever aspect you do. So, for example, I learned that um, your network is your net worth. So, um, in business terms, it's more so about trying to uh, branch out in so many areas that uh, to sell, like, the game of rugby. Um, yeah. There's so many aspects of it that you can sell to people of different departments. So, that's what I loved about it as well. Um, did, did it ever get easier for you? Because you, you made your debut in 2006 and I was just oh, reading. Waratah's debut, yeah. No, no. Wallabies. So when when you made your Wallabies debut, 2005? Five, yes. Yeah, yeah, and you were one of the few people to do that without playing Super Rugby. Is is yeah. that right? So how, how how was that? How, how did you – like I'm interested in your headspace. Were you excited? Were you shitting yourself? Pretty much what you just said. I was shitting myself. Yeah. Um, Who was it? No. Was that against England or Ireland? It was. Yeah. yeah, no, it was against England. Um, so it was a game where Al Baxter got sent off and Matt Dunning got stretched off. Oh, I, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they had to put me uh, in as a reserve prop, but um, fortunately, um, it was uncontested scrum. So, okay. Yeah. So, it was that who was the uh, the big bricklayer that played for England who was just a monster? What was it? Um, was Andy it Sher- Sheridan? Yeah, yeah. 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 But on the other side, they had Phil Vickery, who was a who's a monster as well. Yeah, monster exactly. as well. Um, so, how did it did it get easier from your first test to your ninetieth test, or was it something that you would always like? Did you still get nervous? Yeah, uh, I, even playing fourth grade, I was still nervous. Um, that never leaves you. Uh, the thing for me was uh, the games evolved ever since I first started my first test to the last test when I played in uh, Parramatta. Um, so it got to the point where when, when I first started, you had to put on some bulk. But then later on, later on, they sort of made it more running rugby and you sort of had to lose the bulk, 
but um, get some finesse under your belt. So you're constantly evolving yourself uh, to fit the criteria of what the um, coaching staff want in terms of their game plan. So, yeah, it's just a roller coaster ride of um, body um, composition. It's big, get fit, get skinny, yeah. all that sort of stuff. Who was, who was the coach when you, when you started for the Wallabies? Was it John Conlin? Eddie Jones. Eddie Jones. What were your yeah. – oh, so I've, I've listened to a lot of him talk, and what were your impressions of him? Apparently oh, he's a very very angry man back in the day, but he's apparently calmed down a bit. I, I think so. I've, it's funny, I sort of got the opportunity because he coaches England now. Uh, when I was playing with Leicester, I've yeah. got some in, inside uh, gossip from what um, who they call Beaver. Uh, is like now because when I first started, yeah, it can be intimidating, but uh, I think uh, it wasn't just, it was like a common trend. Uh, it wasn't just specified for certain people. It was more so the fact that it, I think he plays these mental games to test how mentally um, resilient you are. Because yeah. I think but we, we, we wouldn't know it at the time. But at the same time, it's like so. There was like a method to to his madness, to his madness correct. type thing, yep. and you Absolutely. know, all about getting you ready mentally to play. So I could have I could have imagined you as you were you were twenty at that time. Yeah. So you, twenty, just out of the under twenties, I could imagine was he relatively nice to you, or was he pushing you, trying to see if you could get that little mental thing that you need to play test rugby. The only person he was ever nice to that tour. Was Leroy Houston? He was oh, yeah. A baby. yeah, yeah, like, yeah. He was the youngest. He was eighteen or something at the time, Correct. wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, I recall this vividly. Uh, he had an interview, and he impersonated Eddie Jones. Quite funny, actually. But every everyone in the squad's like, oh, you don't was do it on, online somewhere? Uh, no, unfortunately, um, it was just at a sort of a golf day. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Like one of those on-stage type things. Correct, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. We, like everyone thought, okay, pack your bags, Leroy. See you later. But uh, no, uh, I think uh, Eddie uh, admired it quite a fair bit, which is great. So, Mate, one of the things they did during the lockdown was put out a podcast for, um, for England Rugby, and it was just Conor O'Shea just asking him questions, and I, I listened to all of it, and, if anyone anyone out there is interested in coaching, it's definitely something I'd I'd listen to. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's just go through your career a little bit. So you, you first played for the Wallabies, then you ended up going to the Tars. Was that when Ewan was coach? Correct. How how was he? Because from an outsider looking in, he just seemed he seemed like a very good operator. What what were your thoughts about him? Uh, so, as a coach, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you know the movie Moneyball? Yep. That's Ewan in a nutshell. So he would look um, at stats and go ninety percent of the time this line out works and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah but like, um, what he do well is uh, strategize uh, certain weaknesses in certain teams. Um, and get the suited uh, type of player for that team. Um, yeah. It was great how he sort of got everyone in the squad involved because of their strengths. So, I mean, to be honest, like uh, I've got so much respect for you and that uh, it, it's sort of a, a big pity that uh, they sort of uh, left, let him uh, leave the way he did for the Wallabies because I've, Regardless of all of the off-field stuff, he still got the results on-field. So, um, and coming like dead close to getting a Super Rugby title twice, yeah. just goes to show uh, the t- like how well uh, structured he is. Because when so here's a funny story: Will Genya comes up to me. Uh, we're on a 2008 Spring Tour. Go ask me um, what Ewan was like because he just signed from Stade Francais to go uh, coach the Reds. Um, and my my reply to him straight away was, "Don't be surprised when you win it in two years' time." So they did. They did, didn't they? Yeah, 2011. Did they? Well, they, they went. Yeah, 
Yeah. So, um, but it was no surprise because he just knew. Uh, and plus, the Reds at that time were bringing out some awesome young guns as well. So, um, for like, it couldn't have been scripted uh, any better for Ewan because that was sort of his like cup of tea, really. To try it's a bit of redemption and of yeah, oh, definitely. But yeah, like, bit, bit of I think, yeah, I think the rugby spoke for itself because. That was one of the most exciting sort of teams that that I can certainly remember. And oh, what, was it, what was it like playing playing against them? I must say, uh, it was tough. Like um, because they played more a, a more expansive game than we used to uh, like prepare against them. But um, it's no surprise because uh, seeing like the amount of uh, attacking plays that they had. Uh, I was trying to sort of. So you and I have a history of playing chess every now and then uh, when he was at Tars. So yeah. you'd always try and get a few steps ahead of him. Um, so yeah, it didn't surprise me at all. Where uh, there was a game we won right on the buzzer, only because Cliffy managed to score a try, but we were losing because. Uh, Reds were just on the front foot all the time, but they also were tactical with, for example, the kickoff. Rather than kick to the pods, they just grub her in the middle and they send a quick guy to uh, regather it. Yeah. Just little things like that. So, uh, like the the bump behind the defensive line, sort of little kick over. No, just a grubber. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just a grubber because, like, we'd be in our pods ready to try and uh, catch it, but there was no one sort of marking the, the midfield area. So, yeah, uh, it's just, uh, it was just great to see from both playing with him but also playing against him. Like, uh, the, the rugby spoke for itself. And also being under him uh, when he coached the Wallabies, I, I thought he did an excellent job as well. Look, he, he probably got shafted a little bit there. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not sure what happened off-field, but uh, the main thing I could talk highly about him was um, more so when it came to like Wallaby games uh, he'd just have a business mindset of saying okay strengths, weaknesses, opportunities threats yeah. uh, just go do it, you're selected for a reason um, and yeah I think it gave um, all the guys every ounce of confidence to uh, go out there and execute So after you and was it Michael Checker or was it? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So before Ewan, it was uh, Robbie Deans. Yeah. Um, he was great. Uh, just different sort of uh, mindset as well. Like, I think Australian cultures are like the mindset of Australians uh, could be like very sort of like, uh, how I describe it, like always hard on yourself. Yeah. Whereas on the flip side, uh, experiencing a, a coach, from across the ditch, they're quite the opposite. They're very like positively influenced. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'll, so I'm rather more more like looking at what you did badly, they'd look at what you did well. Correct. Or, or or like we could do this better, but we did this well. Exactly that. And so to, to be honest, like I think it was a, quite a bit of a culture shock for guys because they're used to getting told off after yeah. what they did wrong. Whereas really, it's like, well, look what you did right. So. Yeah. yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it's a really interesting concept. It took me a while to uh, get used to it, really, as well, being, uh, yeah, the typical Australian mindset. Um, so after Robbie, it was Michael Checker. Um, Sorry, it was Robbie, then Ewan, then Michael. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So Michael Checker, what's he like? Emotional. Very highly emotional. Um, yeah, uh, hard on a sleeve, but in in some ways quite tactical as well. Um, he he seemed as an outsider looking in, and like we have many mutual friends who who um, you know you can say what you like about about Michael. He's he's a high achiever, and. Yeah. He still took the Tars to a Super Rugby final, mm -hmm. but it seemed like he had really good people around him. Yeah, I think um, uh, uh, people that he knew, 
and trusted because it's sort of like the, the main staff that he took uh, the Waratahs to the final would be sort of transferred across to uh, Wallaby level, uh, yeah. particularly when he got an, um, appointed uh, straight after uh, 2015. So, yeah, I think it was quite funny because, um, like, and quite quite the meteoric rise as well in terms of the World Cup in 2015. Uh, from there on, it's sort of just uh, like it's like it plateaued because yeah. uh, 2016 England came over for a three series and whitewashed us and obviously we're just trying to uh, I think reinvigorate our, our branding because yeah. we didn't have much time to prepare so yeah uh, no, no, uh, can't fault Checker in terms of his approach um, definitely different from all the previous coaches that I've had before but in saying that it's where uh I had to be good enough to sort of adapt and evolve to uh, fit that criteria as well. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit because that's Definitely. just the way my brain works, bro. So uh, apolo- apologies for that. How's your body? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, very good after not having to uh, play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. Like um, I was just saying the other day, I've never felt so good. I haven't packed a scrum in three or four months. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, so the funny you say that because when you stop playing, you actually realise uh, certain movements that your body's used to from playing. That yeah. uh, after relaxing, you sort of needs attention. So, for example, because I'm a hooker, uh, I usually have to anteriorly rotate my left shoulder yeah. to win the shoulder battle or the shoulder height for the loose head. And for some reason, like I just kept favoring this shoulder. Like I thought I was doing like a little hundred percent jiggy dance or something, but um, it's where that's when I realized like, Oh geez, I need to rectify this. So yeah, I've been doing like scapular control for the past three months just because uh, I feel like, so uncoordinated at times. That pr- to... your, your traps probably rock hard as, as well. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, those odd things. They, they get in the way of a, many a thing. Uh, <laughs> you won't see me on the uh, catwalk anytime soon because of them. Oh, mate, you and me both. Hey, are, you doing uh, any, are you doing any training still? Yes. Uh, basically, uh, what I try and maintain is like uh, sort of – routine where I just get up at five and uh, like I spend half an hour waking up and then getting to the gym, um, doing a bit of cardio for what, half so an hour. What do you say? So you, you're just doing, doing cardio, not doing weights or anything like that anymore. Oh, so, so I do cardio weights in the morning. Yeah. And then uh, I do like a hit run. Oh, sorry. A hit session uh, in the evenings. So like a high intensity type. Yeah. Interval. Yeah. Uh, so, it's just more so it helps me mentally more than uh, physically because uh, getting used to sitting uh, at the desk, uh, you get quite fidget- fidgety, uh, particularly when I'm studying at the moment. So I sort of uh, set 90-minute sessions and have a 20-minute break in between. Have you have you found it hard to be motivated? Now you don't have like a bronco test result you got to get or skinnies or, or any of that sort of stuff? Uh, yes and no. I think um, when I sort of gave myself that sabbatical, I just said, you know what, don't really care. But after that, I've sort of realised that I've been festively plump and need to sort of work it off. Yeah. Uh, yeah, only because uh, I feel like uh, I need to. Um, but at the same time, uh, what motivates me now is uh, not making the most of the day. I mean, yeah. We're quite fortunate, particularly this instance in COVID, that we're allowed to still get out of the house and go to different places and whatnot. So, I mean, yeah, I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you about that. I, I don't want to talk about COVID too much because I, th- I feel like it's everywhere. Yeah, um, mate. Have you have you kept in contact with any of your teammates in the UK? Because if you look at the way we're going, it seems like we've done a pretty good job of it. I Amazing. Think amazing job um 
So I was there when I first started and we got locked down in March of 2020. Uh, they started to open up, uh, but because the numbers were still high, uh, unfortunately, uh, they had to go back to tighter restrictions. Uh, funny you talk about keeping in touch with the players. Uh, one of the players, or quite a few of the Leicester Tigers boys, uh, contracted uh, the virus because initially they weren't believers, but when they did, they, were, they couldn't believe like how bad uh, it really was. So they had like fevers, uh, stomach aches. Basically, they lost a lot of weight, so they had to isolate themselves for 14 days and basically uh, try and put the weight back on as quick as possible. So I think um, it's, it's definitely there. And fortunately, well, unfortunately, that when the teammates got it, you just have to be a bit more uh, careful uh, wherever you go. What, what have you learned in 2020? Uh, per- personally, professionally, life, any, any way you want to... How much time do you have? Uh, basically, well, I mean, when I first got back, um, I've realised how awesome it is uh, to be back um, under the circumstances, but still being able to go out and, and travel. I think uh, the rest, well, the Northern Hemisphere would be envious of the Southern Hemisphere because uh, obviously the, the virus lives uh, better under coldest uh, environments. But to to be able to get out of the house, it's like imagining what um, animals are like in the zoo. Oh, absolutely. Um, being locked up like that just for people to come and see you. It's like, yeah, you really feel sorry for those animals where I feel like starting a petition for like zoos in uh, Australia to have a bit more bloody landscape so yeah animals can, yeah just traverse around because yeah it's very unfortunate so yeah i've learned that at the end of the day uh just make the most of what you've got right now um i'm also very uh gratuitous that i'm still alive um yeah. unfortunately i've had a few relatives pass away from it as well from so, from from COVID itself oh, i'm sorry yeah. to hear that man uh, that's all right it happens that was in America. So, yeah, I, I guess, uh, yeah, you just want to make sure that uh, empty the tank, as they say in rugby, uh, yeah. in life. Um, yeah, you don't know how good you got it until it's gone. It's, um, oh, mate, I couldn't agree more. I've, I've, like, you don't want to say it, but I actually kind of enjoyed 2020 in a, in a weird way. Like, mm-hmm. it was, it was a tough year, but, like personally, I, I got so much just like learning well, about myself. Yeah, and, all the main takings. That I just want to do things that I enjoy. <laughs> like I, I've, like that's why I'm doing this because. Yeah. I, I've I wanted to do it for five years, and right. it, if I'm being honest with you, I've just been a complete pussy about it, and sort of worrying that's about what, yeah, worrying yeah. about what other people think and yeah. and. I've decided this year I'm just going to do what I like. That's awesome. You know, and if like at the end of the day, if not another person listens to this, I still get to talk to you, which is, yeah, you know, which is fucking fun. And no, but it's great. I think the, that's half the problem, um, particularly in today's society where a lot of uh, people just sit in their minds quite a fair bit rather than just getting out there and doing it and seeing if it works or not. Um, because, yeah, I think a lot of us live more in fear than opportunity. So, 100, 100%. And I've been like that for my whole life, basically. Well, not my whole life, but in things I haven't fully done what I've wanted to do. Right. Um, for various reasons, but I'm, I'm going to have a go at it now. No, no, it's great. Mate, uh, I'll tell you what, if you need a hand, you just let me know. Mate, I'll, I'll definitely take you up on that. No, for sure. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you, Yep. is I wanted to go into a bit of detail about the mental side of things. Um, I, I've, I've just started coaching, and to me, that's far more interesting than playing. But did you ever do any mental work 
while you were playing? Did you see a sports psychologist or meditate or, or any of that kind of stuff? Or was it all pretty natural to you? Uh, to be honest, uh, I actually uh, outsourced a counsellor um, only because, like, uh, I decided to sort of not involve myself in relationships just because uh, I actually prioritise travelling the world. Yeah. So uh, rather than sort of, like, taking up someone's time um, and space, I could just pay for it and hopefully uh, they can sort of guide me in some direction of sorts. Did, did that know, help? Has that um, helped you? Massively, because um, what creeps into your mind is self-doubt. And the more you can actually talk to someone about it, um, the, the, the release of stress, uh, uh, it feels so good to like be relieved of that. Yeah. Uh, and I started quite young, uh, around 23 years old. Basically, I just was like, I was questioning myself whether I was good enough, even though I was at Wallaby level. Yeah. Whether I was still good enough to keep playing uh, at that level. So, yeah, I uh, outsourced this counsellor, um, and she's been great because at the end of the day, um, she made me realise that uh, why is it that you're purely focused on rugby when uh, the grass is greener everywhere you go? So, yeah, sort of broadened my horizon in terms it, of. Uh, yeah. So I'm just saying, I I think it's I think it's awesome you did that. Do do many guys do that? Is is that is that sort of the norm, or or are most guys sort of a bit insular with that type of thing? Because yeah, yeah. We, we've got a few mutual friends who who are also professional rugby players, and yeah. I know they're very open about um, seeking help for the mental side of things. Yeah. Um. Is that is it normal, or is it a bit bit unusual? Uh, so I got introduced to it by Ewan, uh, when I first signed up with the Waratahs, he actually had a sports psychologist working with the team. And Which would have been unusual at the time. For me it was because I, yeah. I didn't realize, uh, that that was required, but then, um, the more sort of sessions I had with him, it's like, oh, that makes sense because, uh, the game is actually more mental than it is physical. Um, so in order to uh, work on the physical side, why are you neglecting the mental side? Um, yeah. So, yeah, for me, it's quite valuable. And as you said, we have mutual friends um, that uh, may use the service or not. But I think rugby is getting to the point where they see it's quite pivotal in terms of not only um, moving the game forward, but also moving uh, the player's welfare forward. Because the only, only just now have I seen a sports psychologist uh, in the Wallaby level. Only now. Yeah, yeah. That um, that seems amazing to me. Yeah, uh, I think the the coaches take their own sort of path with it because yeah. I guess a lot of it's got to do with the the intrinsic mo- motivation that they provide. Yeah. So. Yeah, but it can only go so far. So that's where I feel like um, when mental, when it comes to mental training, you're not just training how your brain processes things. You're actually trying to make it conscious rather than unconscious. Yeah. For example, you can learn to pass a ball, but under pressure, can you learn how to pass that same ball? Well, I was, I was going to bring up the example of... Um you know, throwing a line. Did you play in the World Cup final that you guys made? Yes. Well, throwing a line out in a World Cup final. Mm-hmm. You've got, you got to hit the tail ball because um, yep. you're going for a try. What goes through? Well, like, that's a pretty high-pressure sort of thing. Um, yeah. Like, what do you think? How, how do you – do you have a process for that? Or is it does it go back to your process or – Yeah, like, usually you sort of – uh, do enough training to go through types of scenarios like that. At the same time, uh, I had this process of like, get to the mark, have a breath, get your hands ready, listen to the core and then throw. So, so you're yeah. not, you're, so you're not, you're shutting out all the, the outside noise of the crowd, the Correct. World Cup final, the pressure of someone yelling at me if I fuck yeah. this throw up. Well, well, what's good was 
listening to the call actually brought you to the present. So you, you sort of had to shut everything out to uh, listen to the call, which is great. Mind you, I, I did miss a, a couple on the final, but uh, they weren't sort of pivotal moments, yeah. unfortunately. Uh, fortunately. But in saying that, uh, I think uh, when it comes down to pressure moments, uh, they're all created by the person thinking about it. So rather than the actual situation itself. Yeah, so so what's the, what's that old saying? Um, I'm an old man and I've known many troubles, but most of them have never come true. True. Yep. Um, what, what's your memories of the final? Was it obviously a, probably a big moment in your life? Uh, did you did you enjoy it? Were you miserable afterwards? I actually enjoyed the journey. Um, so what many people don't know is that uh, – Michael Checker issued us diaries and basically he issued us, he issued us these diaries a hundred days before uh, the World Cup final. So, sort of like a, sort of a calendar sort of diary? like like No, just a journal okay. uh, or just a, an, an empty book. Yeah. Basically, all you had to do was fill in like uh, something that was useful or practical for you in that book to sort of uh, build up towards uh, the final. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have that book, but I remember every single uh, note that I took uh, in the 100 days leading up to it because uh, that's what sort of made it pretty special. You sort of see the little um, improvements every day at training lead up yeah. to like a big occasion. So I think uh, if, if I could put it in an analogy, it's like planting a seed, like a, whatever vegetable, yeah. and then you just record it for a hundred days and you just see the evolution of that. Um, yeah. What, what, uh, what, happened, what happened to the diary? Uh, so basically I took it out after the final, um, read uh read every um, page and then uh, sort of uh, threw it uh, into the river. Oh, wow. Oh, only because, like, uh, it belonged there. Um, I didn't want to sort of carry it back with me uh, as a memento. Yeah. So it was more more like a reflection of the, the memory. So you're going to have that memory for the rest of your life and 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 it's your memory. It's not to be shared kind of thing also it's more so uh to learn from that experience of how could i imply all this build up to other things in life as well which is great where where did you guys do your camp before that one it was a big it was an american university yes uh so before that um uh in australia we got uh taken to kangaroo island um and I think it was more so about just getting to understand each other uh, on a personal basis, but also we went to Fort Denison. Okay, um, yep. Yeah, and uh, basically uh, he asked us why, why we play the game over there. And that, that was pretty much sort of like, um, how do I describe it? Like the, the motto of the journey. Um, Everyone had a different type of why of why they play the game, and that's what sort of motivated them to like bring the best out of them. But then, uh, so we had a test before the World Cup over in Chicago. But yeah, we did have a uh, bit of a brutal uh, preseason camp over in uh, the University of Notre Dame over in okay. uh, Indiana. Uh, that would have been yeah. pretty. That would have been pretty cool. Yeah, very um, interesting setup. Like uh, it's just. One, how big it is, unbelievable. But over there, a lot of the buildings are donated by former alumni. Um, so, yeah, I'm not so sure how it works over there. I think because over there, uh, I think they've got a sort of tax scheme where if you donate a building, um, you can use, like, capital gains from property that you purchase to pay it off. So okay. that's why a lot of the buildings are donated from my former on my students. Sorry, mate. Yeah. But no, can, can you a, hear me? Yep. Yeah. yeah, okay, cool, cool, cool. 
good experience. Um, I actually wanted to see like um, the marching band practice, but uh, unfortunately we couldn't uh, we get us off the premises there. But yeah, so the time we played the um, the Eagles, um, Notre Dame were playing uh, the Longhorns at the oh, yeah. stadium. Yeah, so which probably would have been five times bigger. Oh yeah, literally like. <laughs> Um, so we left on the Friday and you can see all these like big um, like truck tra- truck trailers coming through to get set up for the uh, game. Mate, um, I, got, I have an uncle that works for, I think, one of the big sports companies in Europe. And he said part of their gig is selling TV rights for like college football, English Premier League. And oh, he right. said the, the, big, the biggest revenue for their company is college sports in America. Yeah, so, uh, it, it's billions. Uh, um, and to be honest, like it doesn't surprise me, just because of the the numbers that they get uh, to college. Um, it, well, any, any business magnate with half a brain would probably sell their products oh, over absolutely. there. Absolutely. Yeah, Under Armour have made a killing from college football alone. Oh, I'd, I'd imagine so. I'd imagine yeah. so. Um, I'm going to change the subject just a little bit because my brain's... Just... Go for it. You, so you studied while you were playing? I did. Um, done an undergrad more... in... Uh... Sorry, you go, you go. I did an undergrad um, in IT, finished in 07. But what I knew then was I don't need it anymore because it's obsolete. But yeah. I decided to sort of uh, pursue business. So I got my diploma in that and then just finishing off, like currently studying an MBA for the time being uh, in business administration. So that's, so that's how you're feeling your days at the moment? For the time being, yes. But um, also uh, learning um, a bit of, excuse me, a bit of Spanish. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can, you speak any other, can you speak any other languages? Uh, yeah, I've got a bit of fluency in Japanese, okay, but it's more so, uh, like very um, informal, yeah, just because I'll, I'll learn, learn listening to um, guys of Japanese. Can you, can uh, you speak second. any, can you speak any Tongan or anything like that? Oh, sorry, yeah, well, uh, English is my second language, yeah. um, so you grew up in a household speaking Tongan, Tongan, correct, and uh, you got punished if you didn't. Which is, I think like, it's a I think it's a good thing because it's, yeah. it's I got a lot of Tongan mates who don't speak Tongan. And oh really? Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like having that connection to your heritage would only be a good thing. Or well, put it this way, Duncan. Like um, you get to a point where, like, if worst case scenario, touch wood, um, someone dies and you're the oldest in the family, yeah, you sort of have to like. Uh, speak on behalf of your family to the rest of the families that show up. So uh, I understand like uh, some families don't make it as uh, like strict as they, uh, as my mum did, but at the same yeah. time, I thank her every single day because of it. Um, but I sort of get my English grammar mixed up with my Tongan grammar. So, oh but, that, but that's all right. Like uh, everyone understands which is good. So, um, yeah, but, what are you going to use the MBA for? Did you are you going to get into your own business? Did did you want to work for someone? What's yeah. what's the plan? Yeah, the plan is to try and get uh, my own business of sorts. Like you, uh, I'm still trying trying to figure out what department, but I might start off with like a little takeaway shop just to see how that goes. But then. Um, just learning the different facets of the uh, like business um, venture. It's quite interesting. Um, didn't know how much goes into play, particularly if you're a sole trader of sorts. But it's yeah, I I always looked at when I was like I'm still kind of working for people, but when I first started working for myself, mm-hmm. then, oh, I'm living the dream. I've got my own business, and you're doing seventy to eighty hours yeah a week. Yeah. I mean, a great, a great example is your lovely mother where you, she's got oh, the exactly coffee right. van. Yeah, exactly, so. exactly right. Shout out to the coffee van. Yeah, massive shout out. And she, uh, she works her ass off. Well, I'll tell you what, it's a great brew of coffee that she makes too. So yeah, she, she, um, 
she's one of the few people I've met that is an absolute perfectionist. So she would be thrilled to hear you say that. And um, I'll definitely pass that on. No, I appreciate that. Thanks. It's, um, oh, mate, I'm not going to keep you too much longer. I really appreciate your time. Um, no, no, it's fine. Mate, fire away. I've got um, just some random questions I'm going to ask you. Go for it. Do you read much? Love reading. What books, what kind of books do you like? Uh, I don't mind a bit of fiction, um, but at the same time, uh, sort of going through this new venture of life, um, started reading upon sort of um, like, uh, how do I put it? Um, like motivation, not motivational books, more so like things that uh, people like give back to the community as a past experience. Yep. Uh, I don't know how you call that, like welfare books or something it's like that. It's like, um, like a businessman passing on what they know kind yeah. of thing. So, for example, um, I read um, Robert Kiyosaki's uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Oh, yep, yep. Uh, great book. Basically, um, it's like a multi-millionaire giving back what he, he learned as a kid. Um, but he was fortunate enough to sort of have a juxtaposition of a, a well-educated father, but a fa- another father who's his mate's father, didn't know much, but knew a little bit of everything. But he ended up being uh, the richer dad uh, because of that. So, yeah. yeah, and it just explains why. So uh, books like that. Um, yeah, uh, if I had a favourite book, I must say that there's so many, but to narrow it down to, say, two, I'd say one of them is The Book Thief by Marcus <laughs> Zizza. Which one? The Book Thief? Yeah. Okay, I haven't heard of that one. Who's who's that boy? Marcus Zusak. Okay. Is that a fiction uh, is that a fiction book or non fiction? Yeah. Uh, I'm not too sure. I think there were like elements of uh, true. So like based on a true story type thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, well basically it was set on World War Two. Um okay. really really written. Um, so have have you read the Da Vinci Code? Yeah, loved it. Loved yeah, it. I, re- I read it over Christmas. Loved it. Oh, so and I feel like the movie does not do it any justice because it missed so many awesome yeah. points. Like uh, my favorite point about that book is um, the divine proportion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what they call it, fee or something. Uh, it's the, it's the the what's the guys? It's a famous painting. I've seen it. Oh, the Vitruvian Man. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yes. Yeah. And what's the divine proportion? It's like three point. Oh, I can't even remember what it is, but I reckon I'd recommend anyone to read that book. Oh, the book's definitely. so much better than the movie. And yeah. I, I got it like last time I was in Europe, I got a little bit into it. And a lot of the stuff he mentions is based on facts. real. Yeah. Um, so, it's, so it makes the story like better, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like somewhat. Um, attainable like, yeah yeah also uh the other book angels and demons yeah that's a good um, book too yeah great book like I, i've actually been fortunate enough to go through the vatican um and did even you, uh, underneath did, the terms did you enjoy it oh loved it but it was kind of ironic that you see a lot of poor people around it and yeah they still don't get help so but um yeah I, interesting tour i i thought uh I thought the Vatican was one of the most amazing places I've ever been. Why is that? Uh, I, I always had this thing about Rome. Like for me, Rome was like that sort of dream romantic type place. And then like, I'm, I'm not religious at all, but mm-hmm. you feel it when you're there, if that Fair makes enough. sense. And yeah. then the when you walk into the Sistine Chapel, to think that a guy painted that on his back, uh, yeah. you know, I, I'd... Like I met a couple of people who didn't like Rome, and yeah, I just I struggled with those type of people. Yeah, and I feel like um, they've quite blinkered because they've been either they've been educated or uh, they've yeah heard some malicious rumors about it where they don't want to be believed. Um, unfortunately for them, like 
when you see it right there, it's like, how can you not like you feel that? you feel you feel something there, and yeah, uh, I don't know what it is, but it's it's very noticeable when you're there. Uh, uh, what was your favorite part, like apart from the system? <sighs> Do you, uh, do you get go underneath? I, I did. I did. I've been three times now. The oh, nice. the, the first time I went, uh, John Paul had just passed away. Oh wow! And I went past. So they'd only just put his tomb in underneath where the the tomb of the popes was. Yep. And um, you know, I think I was eighteen at the time. Just a dumb, just a dumb kid. And I'm walking past. The, the, this was in the days before smartphones, and yeah, so you, yeah. you had to have the the handheld map to work your yeah. way around, kind of thing. And also the uh, digital camera that. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had all that, and I've I've gone past it, and there was probably a line two hundred meters long, um, for people that wanted to just sort of kiss kiss his tomb, or just be be near him. And man, that, that that was it blew me away, to be honest with yeah. you. That's, no, was... What about you? What about you? What did you did you have? So did you do much travel when you were at Leicester? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, was this more just from rugby tours over the years? Yeah, definitely from rugby tours because uh, it was, we were fortunate enough that we got to play in Rome because usually uh, most of the rugby teams are up north. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, when we did, uh, most of the lads uh, took to either the Colosseum or to, yeah, um, yeah the Vatican, which is great. Um, but I, I, so... Recalling from the book, I loved how I wanted to try and get to all the four different points on the map as well yeah. um, that they mapped out, but unfortunately didn't have enough time. So, yeah, uh, actually, uh, what's the – there's a place, it's like an observatory. Uh, in the Vatican? No, I'll, I think just or near do the you lo- Like with the old ruins? Yeah. Yeah, Palatine Hill. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, um, I, when I went past there, I was like, holy shit, they made that back in the day. It's like, yeah. it's quite you amazing just, what they You could achieved. imagine, hey. Yeah. So, no, it's um, awesome. Where, where's your favourite touring location? Ah, uh, no, nah, you can't ask me that. It's too many. <laughs> well, I mean, so it's it's like trying different cuisines, really. Like, yeah. I, don't, I, I don't have a favourite cuisine because... You just like them all. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's sort of, uh, you sort of have to picture yourself being there and the ingredients that they had at the time to yep. use. So, um, yeah, I mean, where do you start? Like, uh, going to, so, yeah, I've never, I actually haven't had pizza since going to Italy last. It ruins it for you. Well, yeah, but like, seeing how they make it over there, is totally different from how they make it over here. Yeah. But like the base, the base just like over there, it's like for some reason it's perfect. Like not too crusty, but not too doughy either. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think they mm, get mixed up with the proportions over here. But um, actually uh, one thing I discovered over there was uh, dried mullet row. Oh, yeah. They call yeah, it targa. No, I didn't have that. All oh, right. So basically, that. they dry it and it becomes like something you can grate. Yeah. Um, but I've had a massive fan ever since. And truffles. Oh my oh, god. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mate, right. if you if you like food, Italy is pretty hard to beat as a place to go. Correct. Yeah. Um, but I also, went... sorry. Uh, you can. Uh, uh, when you traverse throughout the whole place, uh, they've got their own take in terms of like yep. their pestos, their uh, Napolitans. There's different those. pizzas. To, oh, look, so I spent a few months uh, in just outside of Milan. Oh, uh, nice. And, north? Yep, yeah, north. A uh, little town called Piacenza. It, uh, oh. yeah, it ended probably a little too briefly, but oh, uh, uh, mate, in, in hindsight, it's a good thing. But I, I ended up going, going around sort of Italy for 10 weeks and you get very, very fat. If you, if you enjoy your gelato, your pizza and your pasta, you get very, and your wine, you get very, very fat very quickly. Yeah, I was going to say, how do they do it? 
I have not, mate. So we, I so I played for this little team in the Syria top ten or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. And on on um, you'd have like a team run on the Friday before a game. Yep. And I, I'd always go to this cafe to get a double espresso. And I walk in, and there'd be these ambulance workers who are mid shift sharing a bottle of sparkling white wine and a pizza <laughs> at oh. like 10 10 30 in the morning and um i was just going and they were still working i, I i'd ask the guy and work work is very low on the italian uh priority list <laughs> so well it's, uh, it's not even a priority when you go further south <laughs> no well no i reckon it's it's probably sport food uh, your mistress, your family, then your wife. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know and, and, and then you know, fifth, you know, your extra income stream, and then your job after that. <laughs> oh, don't forget the um, what do they call it, those orange drinks. Oh, oh the uh, uh, I had I had a thousand of them. Uh, the yeah. spritzes, aperol spritz. Yeah, yeah, aperol spritz. <laughs> yeah, jeez. I'll tell you what, uh, one of my mates uh, used to play over there. And, um, he started off in Viadana, but went up north to um, Chaka. In, oh, uh, yeah. Mate, right. oh, all, all I remember was being on a drip bag full of bloody splits. <laughs> that's so good. Oh, yeah. mate. Mate, that's, that probably uh, contributed, contributed to my downfall from that rugby. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, no such thing. Oh, yeah. We'll t- we won't talk about that. Anyway, a couple more questions. Sure. Um, are you a documentary guy? Uh, good question. Um, to be honest, I haven't had much time to sort of uh, watch any TV, uh, let alone documentary, so to speak. But I am quite a massive fan of documentaries, uh, particularly uh, of the National Geographic type. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, David Attenborough, uh, take your hat off to you. What a legend. Great narrator. Um, but also, uh, like, I'll describe it. It's from there that, that I watched, uh, like, chefs going around the world trying yeah. different street food. It's like Anthony Bourdain. Yeah. So, pretty what, similar. My, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly that. So, I mean, that, yeah, like, you try and emulate that, but I don't think you... It's pretty hard. It's just, pretty hard at yeah. the moment. No, that's um, right. What's your favourite drink? If you could have any drink in the world, alcoholic, non-alcoholic? <sighs> drink? Um, <laughs> uh, so, alcoholic, I'd probably say... Um, a gin martini. Okay. Actually, uh, there's something called a highball martini where, um, yeah, it's gin based, but rather than serving it in like the normal uh, martini glasses, serve it in the short glass, uh, but more um, vermouth. Jeez, I'll okay. tell you what, vermouth is delicious. I've, <laughs> um, I've, I've, I've never had a good gin experience. All right. Yeah, never, ever. Have you ever had a gin martini? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll have to try it again now I'm a bit older because I, I, I never liked whiskey until maybe six months ago. All right. So, so maybe it's one of those things that as you get older. A single malt? Yeah. Yeah. A favorite? Um, I tried Glen Morangi. Nice. Because my, my granddad would drink it and I thought that, that was the only one I knew. So I'm like, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll try that. Are you, are you a whiskey drinker? Oh, is a Pope Catholic. Um, yeah, basically, uh, I'm actually a big fan of Japanese whiskey. Okay. Um, like, don't get me wrong, I love the Highland Scotches as well. Yeah. But to, uh, you can't sort of compare the whiskies. It's more so uh, just different uh, orientation of, like, um, taste. Japanese whiskey seems very neat yeah where uh highland uh is quite um peaty but still enjoyable um do you, don't tell me you, you use rocks do you my i got a did you meet pony when you played us earlier in the year pony, pony. Rob, rob james he's he probably yeah, had a, yeah. he probably had yeah. a beer with us at, at some point yeah. and 
he's a real whiskey sort what of. What do you drink. call him, Pony? Because uh, his brother's name's Horse. Oh, what? <laughs> yeah, his brother. Oh, he's, look, his, his brother was a maniac that I played Colts with and right. kind of drifted off. And then it was just one of those nicknames that just took. I think you hated oh, it right. to start with. So. <laughs> and um, he, he is a real whiskey wanker. And um, yeah, there's little the rocks he put in the freezer. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. You, you're not, oh, no, you know, no, just any rocks. Like, you know, how they scorch on the rocks. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm still, mate, I'm still not across it. I, I kind of aim for that $50, $60 mark and uh, anything <laughs> anything above that, I, I don't feel like I appreciate it. Yeah, fair um, enough. Just to finish, I've got a couple yeah. more questions for you. I really thank you for this, man. No, no, no worries. I'm doing some radio on you, a reading on you, and you you have a cousin that was in the WWF? <laughs> is, is, is that right? <laughs> Uh, well, he was in the WWF, yes. Um, well, basically, um, he started off as a semi wrestler. Okay. And then when he went to Hawaii to do an exhibition there, um, someone introduced him to like professional wrestling over there. He just so happened to be bloody uh, Rocky Johnson. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So um, basically, he joined up with uh, Rocky Johnson on, on the road uh, doing their wrestling gigs. And yeah, so I happened to uh, have uh, a bit of guidance for the rock as well. Okay, uh, that, that's pretty cool. So, so he was yeah. one of he would would have been sort of a mentor to, to the rock, maybe. Yeah, pretty much. So one of well, his dad's friends, and yeah. And the funny thing was, like uh, when the rock first started wrestling, he had no costume, and uh, so I happened he called up my cousin uh, to uh, lend him a pair of his. Uh, like purple chunks yeah so yeah and then uh about five years ago the rock turns up to his house with a brand new ute and i uh, said hey you like my ute it's like oh, this is my cousin I said yeah looks yeah. nice I said well it's yours um basically he wanted yeah he cool. wanted to thank him for providing the uh chunks back in the day yeah, he seems like a good dude the rock yeah well um so uh the cousin that you mentioned, um, he doesn't know this, but my favorite wrestler was the Ultimate Warrior, and his first title defense was against my cousin. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so you got you were betting against your cousin? Yeah, pretty much. But uh, I said, oh, yeah, oh no, not too much. That type of stuff. So, yeah. What was uh, what was his wrestling name? Uh, King Haku. King Haku. Uh, for, okay. He also made a, a appearance in WCW. Oh, yeah. uh, as Ming. So. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Matt, that's pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> last thing I want to ask you, and I'll let you go. Who's the best player you ever played with or against? Oh, actually, two questions. Who's the best player off-field that you ever played with or against? And who's the best player on-field? And they can be the same person. Uh, wow. I'd have to toggle because um, there's so many. Um, I'd probably say off field um, would have to be um, Dan Vickerman. Off, off field? Off field. Off um, field. Like, just puts on a massive, like, uh, uh, bravado on field, but such a gentle giant off the field, uh, yeah. very articulate as well. Um, yeah, it's pretty tragic when he passed away as well. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Uh, but I had a lot like he, he was a, a big reason why I sort of uh was successful today because he helped me a lot with uh my line out throwing. Um, so, so um, yeah. one of our mutual friends, uh, Dan Palmer. I think he he was probably in the Tars around the time Vickerman was exiting, yep. Yep. and he said that um, he was a lovely guy off off field, but on field, if you fucked up your rolling the line out or you missed a throw, you heard about it. Oh, so so he did this to both me and Adam Fryer uh, in the one game. It was against the Reds. It's like, tough. Do you want me to? Let you control the line out. You know how to throw over to my way. 
you fucking piece of shit. <laughs> and he chased me for two, like two minutes around the field, just letting me know that. And during the I middle came, of the play. Yeah. I came <laughs> on. Um, this was 2008. I remember. Yeah. It was the last game against the Reds. Um, yeah. And then Adam went on because uh, I broke my hand. And then Adam missed the one out too. And you can just see, Adam. I thought Tatafu was bad, but you stink. <laughs> and he's just chasing me around for five minutes until yeah. the next break. And it's like, oh, wow, yeah. And Dan was so spot on with that comment. Um, because not many people realise how passionate um, Dan was, not just with rugby, but like everything. Um, like, there was a reason why he smoked. It's because, like, it was just what he knew growing up. Growing up. And yeah. Like, I couldn't care less if you smoked and I was just more so whether you do the job. And, like, the goal would be first thing, uh, first person at training, just studying line outs and where the opportunities would be and last to leave. So, yeah, and that's, that, uh, that's the ethic I try and sort of uh, live up to uh, throughout the rest of my living days. Beautiful. Um, what what on about field? on field? Yeah. Um, geez. Yeah. I mean, Wow. It's a good question because... Because you played against everyone, really. Yeah, but also, like, with certain guys, um, like, it was pretty hard to sort of... Should I, should I make it easier for you? Yeah. Who's, a, who's the best hooker you ever played against? Best hooker I've played against? Uh, there were two. Um, Bismarck did Plessy. Oh, yeah. Um, and also... Um, uh, William Servat of France. The, the French, the French guy. Yeah, actually, I actually have to say both French hookers that were playing there were um, uh, good hookers because William was the bigger type. Yeah. And there was a uh, Dimitri Zaziski. Yep. Um, who was like a small type but really mobile around the paddock, and like tell you what, bloody hell. Uh, I've never seen a bloody good-looking hooker like he is. He's a handsome man. <laughs> oh, tell you what, Fabio, move out of the way, mate. Yeah. Um, no, but, it, um, in, uh, terms, in terms of scrummaging? Or, or is uh, it just, just as rugby players in general? Well, um, Bismarck and William in scrummaging. Yeah. Um, and obviously, Bismarck was a big boy, so for him to get around the paddock was quite remarkable. Um, but even... Uh, with Dimitri, uh, like, uh, he was as quick as a winger. Um, so catching him was like, yeah, you'd be fortuitous if you did. So, yeah. Beautiful, mate. Actually, I've got one more thing to ask you. Go for if, it. If you could give advice to 18 year old you, what would you say? Uh, yeah. If I was to look at 18-year-old me, I'd say um, don't be afraid of uh, failing um, because failing is a massive part of success. I was sort of hesitant at first uh, coming into the rugby arena of um, fucking up or making a mistake so much that that's where my whole sort of procrastinating started because... I'd always, I'd always talk myself into the fact that I was never good enough and what am I still doing here? So if, if I was talking to my 18-year-old self, I would be saying, you know what? Uh, at the end of the day, everyone fails. But it's what you do to make it a success. And if you can take that into every single aspect, not just uh, talking with your friends, uh, school, business, life, um, even going for walks, like uh, it's okay to like fall down every minute, once in a while. It's just the hardest part of getting back up and doing it again. Um, mate, that's a beautiful way to finish. Are oh, you yeah. going to have a run around fourth grade again this year, or are you? Yeah. Um. You're done. Oh, to be honest, like uh, so, I've. Like you, I've actually taken um, the level three coaching um, course. 
I haven't done my level threes. Is that is that worth doing? I think I think it is because uh, it's sort of yeah, a bit more um, tailored into which area uh, you want to sort of coach. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like. I'm only doing it just to expand my sort of um, learning as well because I actually prefer being a, a player coach as opposed to a proper coach. Yeah. Um, whereas uh, if you sort of – so we had, we've had two sessions. Uh, we watched the Wallabies on the second session. And to be honest, I actually – stay to watch the backs because I've never been able to see what yeah. the backs do. Yeah, um, for sure. So fascinating. Um, so this it's, was a game. They do host, fuck all, don't they? Well, <laughs> I thought they did. But yeah. to be honest, like, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad I was a forward because the amount of running they do in their <laughs> finish session. Yeah, true. Hell. Um, so, for example, this was a game post-Argentina Newcastle, but preparing for Argentina um, at Bank West. They realised that because Argentina play a high line, there's a bit of gap, a uh, bit of space uh, behind. Yeah. So the, the backs had to um, play two pass touch with three tackles, but you must put a kick in somewhere. Okay. So it was making them work uh, to identify where the space was, but also not forgetting uh, to play rugby as well. So yeah, I, I thought it was a great concept to sort of be a part of because as a forward it's like you don't really you never think yeah, about it no you're just worried about what the call is in the liner and uh getting on song with the call of the scrum so yeah it was very fascinating and um also uh so scott wiseman is the um attack coach he presented to us about um just like coaching philosophies important to have one how you mold it you let the um, game be your teacher uh, what he means by that is nothing goes uh, ever according to plan so it's more so how you can uh, bring structure to chaos um, oh sorry from chaos as opposed to playing uh, 80 minutes worth of chaos uh, is what he was trying to sort of uh, pass on to us which is great yeah, that's beautiful. So are you, yeah. you going to jump in and help um, two blues this year? Uh, maybe. I think uh, I actually want to get I actually want to get away from the game just to yeah. um, give this uh, sort of new chapter a proper go because at the end of the day, like, I still believe rugby will be there. Um, yeah. but it's more about ho- hoping to sort of get some sort of footprint um, in the in the current world and then hopefully once that starts to build then which is probably a good thing like oh, i've seen and you've probably seen it as well these guys that all they have is rugby and yeah you know oh, the yeah. amount of times yeah so for example duncan like the amount of times don't get me wrong it, it's not a bad thing but guys will be on video games which is great like, mm. i highly encourage it um it's but when they're constantly on it, like the, the sort of false sense of security with that is like they won't be there once rugby's done because everyone's got their lives to live. Yeah. So, yeah, hopefully if they can like pull in small doses, by all means, you know, continue it. But I'm fortunate enough that like I sort of got a bit of taste of like real life itself. So, yeah, like I didn't sort of have to rely on trying to catch up with guys is more about discovering uh, the world myself and that yep. required me to motivate myself to do it which is a mate, it's a pretty good way of looking at it to be to be fair yeah um man i could talk to you all day uh no. I, re- I really appreciate this man um no, if you fine one of the mate i probably the boys the fourth grade boys were thrilled to play against you this year why is that uh it, look most of them they're all great blokes but most of them are pretty much obliterated by the time first grade run on. So, yeah. they, you know, we've we've had guys that have played for the Wallabies at the club, but yeah, you know, very few of them have actually been sort of on the field where where any professional player um, was playing. And yeah, 
and um, you know having beers after the game and they they some of the boys still talk about it. Did do you remember Dane Bastard? Yeah, day to day. Oh, yeah. man, I love the stuff you do with like um, the is it pack? Yeah, the Pig Athletic Club. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, so. That's amazing. He's a he's a character, but um, he's going. He goes to me. He's he's kind of like he's he's a great bloke. Don't get me wrong, but he's got a bit of a sense of where he's at, which probably isn't in touch with reality. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going, oh, all these rugby players are following me now. <laughs> so he's become sort of semi-famous. <laughs> oh, that's so good. So, so I promise one of the boys, I'd. I'd Challenge you for him to a chari- charity boxing mo- fight because I think he would absolutely shit himself once he hears this. <laughs> <laughs> so, mate, if you if you can, let us know and I'll I'll arrange that. No, by all means. Like, uh, <laughs> uh, I must say, uh, he, he came on in the second half, right? Yeah, he played because yeah, I remember looking at him. I'm like. Uh, did, what? Did you, no. You're like, what's that be, front rower standing on the wing? <laughs> yeah, no, but could you be the Dane that offered the challenge? <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, so moments like that, um, Duncan. You, so what I try to tell my fourth grade guys is that uh, no squad will ever be the same. Um, it always changes, but that's life. It's what you put into it. Is what hopefully it comes back out in spades. So, um, what I've enjoyed about last year was teaching them just simple things like uh, there's a lot, they didn't know that um, you know how like teams work with home structures. Yeah, yeah, they didn't know that was a concept in rugby. Oh. So here they here they thought that was just like okay, you just go around okay. the same way, and then go around the same way. It's like, guys, listen, you go here. Whenever you finish an activity, just go back here because, one, you save energy. Two, you actually make us spread the field because at the end of the day, you the, 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 the defence cannot um, cover all of us. So the more uh, wider we look, the, less, the, the more gaps uh, will be provided. And they just look so dumbfounded. It's like, why the hell have we, are we only learning this now? And these are guys I used to play with uh, from the start of uh, Turbulence. It's like, uh, I think we haven't done well in terms of recruit, recruitment, in terms of coaching. But at the same time, it's never too late to learn. So, um, and, 100%. Yeah, but the boys took it to it so well that, like, they – what they tried to do was try and teach the Colts boys that. But unfortunately, the Colts uh, were quite meticulous with their coaching. Um, but uh, it's just it's the, the satisfaction of seeing the guys' faces after, of like, uh, implying that from training to the rugby paddock and getting a win. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's what that's why I enjoy doing it. So I'm sure you did the same when you uh, helped out. The oh, 100%, boys. mate. Let me ask 100%. you this. 100%. I've, yeah. Sorry. Um, what, so at what point did you know when to retire? Um, I probably should have, if I'm being really honest with myself, I probably yeah. should have retired in 2018. I had decided to stop playing tight head prop and wanted to play hooker. Yeah. And mostly because I was just struggling with my body. Yeah. Um, well, any this major year, part of the body? just my back. I've just had back pain, and and it was oh. one of those things that no one could ever, uh, just everywhere to be honest. Oh. But it was it was one of those things no one ever diagnosed because I've, I've kind of I've m- mostly just lack of control through the hip region and probably not being strong enough. But this year we had a good coach, um, Todd. Yeah. Uh, who you know. And I thought, you know what? I've never had this in my rugby career. I'm going to have a go. And I got really fit. I got really strong for the first time in my life. And I was going really well. Yeah. And I had a concussion in the trial against West Harbour before the COVID shutdown, which wasn't too bad. 
Yep. And then we, we went through all the shutdowns and came back to full contact training after the, you know, the period where you were just training on your own. Yep. And I took a hit that was a nothing hit. And I had sort of problems with my head for about six weeks. And I looked at it and went, oh, and so I was out for six weeks, no exercise at all. Went from being the fittest in my life, training in the first grade team. Mm -hmm. And around that time when I was coming back, Harry McLennan, one of the young guys at South, had a yep. career ending injury and um, fantastic fellow. He's, he's very lucky that, that he's going to be completely okay. The seven? And I looked at, yeah, the seven. Man, yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Mate, great player. Yeah. Off, you know, even and an even better black too, which was which just made it worse. And yeah, and I looked, I looked at it and I went, I'm 32, I'm playing third grade. I've pretty much, you know, I haven't done what I wanted to, but I've had so much fun. Mm. Like, just get to the end of it, and that's that's it. Like the juice wasn't worth the squeeze anymore. Yeah, yeah. If that make if that makes sense. No, it totally makes sense, and that's where I think the six months sabbatical for me made me realize, like. Yeah, the juice is definitely not worth the squeeze because uh, stories like that um, make you realise like you've been fortunate that there's not many people get a, a tenure of professional rugby like I have. So um, quit while you're winning, uh, but at the same time, like so many more things in life that I want to achieve, just like you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it sort of gave me like a clear um, decision just to go, you know what? I've had my time. It's been great. Man, and, you know and you've, you've come out the other side and, and correct. And, and you know, you, you know, like I, 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 could, I can't imagine you have any regrets. Uh, actually, I sort of did when um, like around the Robbie things area. Because he said I was the number one hooker. I yeah. still sucked out of myself, unfortunately, to the point where I did myself injustice and kept getting injured. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's one of those, it's one of those things. I'm sure, like, like all, all high achievers, you probably wouldn't have got to where you got to if you really mm -hmm. focused on, on, if you weren't sort of worrying about how to get better and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And, but, but looking back now, must have been fun. Did you have oh, fun? Like, I feel sorry for the um, generation coming through now of professional rugby. I was lucky enough to experience, like... Because you kind of bridged both, really, didn't correct. you? Yeah. yeah. Um, like, to the point where... So, I remember my first uh, rugby tour, and it was with Eddie. And, yeah, those were the days where, like, um, kangaroo court was still around. Can you hear me? And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just checking. That I've still got some bat. Oh, hold on. Sorry, bro. No, yeah. There we go. I'm just checking. I got a little bit of battery left, so we'll oh, have to cool. wrap. We'll have to wrap up shortly. But keep, yeah, keep no, going. No, keep right. going. No, I was just saying, like, uh, with um, the era when I first started with Eddie Jones, like that's when Katie the Root was still around, and like I think that social aspect itself like made the game so much enjoyable, but also easier to bond. Whereas now, oh, I because, agree totally. Yeah, because like everything's so like um, uh, focused in terms of the result, you sort of miss out the main point of building that bridge to bond with each other. So, yeah, I, I feel like that gets highly underviewed in terms of the important stepping stone for any team to achieve anything. I I have a theory that the best way to Bond is the beers, not the Broncos. And I've thought that my whole life and no one has ever been able to convince me otherwise. <laughs> well, I mean, imagine doing both. Well, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And that's when you really, that's when you really nail it. Yeah, because like the Bronco, you, if you convince yourself to go flat out, like you'd be, one, you'd be surprised all the time you get, but two, like you've got a cold, freshie waiting for you at the end of it too. 100 yeah. percent let's finish awesome. let's finish on that brother um right. if, when we play you guys i think you guys will be at home this year come and have a beer for sure um, um yeah if you're, if you're still around if you're still around
Oh, I'll let you know. But uh, at the same time, uh, I think they're trying to uh, get in contact with me for a coaching. I said, oh, I'd be happy to be like a, a scrum mentor, but not necessarily coaching. So, yeah, we'll see. All, all right, brother. It's good to chat and um, I'll let you know when this is all up. All good. No worries. Good Thank luck you with so it. much, mate. mate. Thank you. No, well done on the first step. Thank you, mate. Thanks. Yes, mate. Catch you. Catch yeah. you tough.